Hello everyone, my name is David Connolly and in this video I want to compare two types of urban heating infrastructure with one another, which is the gas grid and the district heating grid. This builds on a previous presentation I gave about the three key pillars of the heating sector, where one of those key pillars was how we heat the densely populated urban areas. The reason this is a unique area is because in these areas, the buildings are located so close to one another that they can in fact share a common heating infrastructure. And the two that I would like to compare in this video are the gas grid, and a water grid, which is often referred to as district heating. And this is where they share this infrastructure with one another across multiple buildings. In order to compare these two networks with one another, we have to define a common framework for both. So to do that, I've defined here what are the key components within each network, and further broken that down into three key costs for each of those. So I want to present to you first of all the framework so you understand how I'm comparing these two networks with one another. So the first key cost or key component for each of these networks is the supply cost. In the district heating scenario that's the, the cost of producing heat at a central plant while in the gas situation that's actually the price of extracting fuel from a reservoir or from the ground to actually supply that fuel to the network. So you can see already there's a distinction here between the two options because because gas extraction usually happens at a, f a long way from the end user, while in the district heating system, the heat supply often happens in the same town as city, our city, as the final consumer. The second key cost or component then is the transport of this heat or fuel to the final consumer via a transport or piping network. In almost all cases for both of these uh, different um, options, it's a, a piping infrastructure. In the district heating scenario, it's the transfer of hot water from the central plant to the building, and then the return of the cold water from the building back to the plant again to be reheated once more. In contrast, the, the gas piping network is, is not bidirectional, but is only unidirectional, because the gas only goes in one direction from the gas reservoir to the final user. So that again distinguishes it, distinguishes it slightly, and of course another key distinction, as this, this is that the, the gas network often goes across numerous countries, whereas in the district heating scenario, the network is often a local network that is restricted to a single town or city. The final key component then is the consumer's heating unit. And what I mean by that is the unit that's actually in the user's building itself. And for, for example, in the district heating scenario, that's the heat exchanger that takes heat from the district heating network and puts it into the building, whereas in the in the gas situation, that is actually a gas boiler that combusts the fuel from the network and produces heat within the building itself. So this is the framework I've created to make these um, networks somewhat comparable to one another. They have a supply price, they have a transport price, and they have a consumer's heating unit uh, price. And the way that I'm going to compare these in this video is using an annual cost. So on the left hand side you have what is the total annual cost for the consumer's heating unit, for a district heating system, and for a natural gas boiler. And this is just component three, so just the boiler and the substation. For a hypothetical scenario where we're supplying 50,000 urban dwellings with district heating, or alternatively with nat natural gas. So this is the total annual cost for just the substations for district heating or just the boilers for the natural gas grid for these 50,000 urban dwellings if I just create this hypothetical scenario to compare the two networks with one another. The other component that I mentioned was the piping costs. So if we add those in, and I've added those in based on typical Danish um, district heating and natural gas prices, you can see then that the pipes uh, are, are maybe less than half so far of the cost for the district heating network, where they're around 20% of the cost for the natural gas grid. You can see that the natural gas price uh, pipes are slightly cheaper than the district heating pipes, whereas the natural gas boilers are more expensive than the district heating substations. The final key component then that I highlighted was the supply. And now I'm purposely not adding the supply straight away because I want to first demonstrate how difficult it is to define a single number for the supply price. And the reason this is so important, and this is revealing the result maybe perhaps in advance, is that the supply price is actually the largest part of the total costs 
uh, in the end. So the supply, what we assume for the supply price is actually really, really important. And so before I put one single number on it, I want to first of all demonstrate how difficult it is to define exactly what the supply price should be. To do that, I want to start by first of all discussing this gas supply. So this graph here is from BP and it illustrates over the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so just how variable the gas price or gas supply price is across different years and different countries. So, for example, if I lived in Germany in 2013, my gas price is almost three times higher than it would be if I lived in the US. However, if I lived in Germany in the year 2002, my gas price is actually the same price as it was in the US. So you can see that the gas price has fluctuated dramatically from each year, one year to the next, and has also started to change dramatically across different countries. So this just shows you then if I have to define how much my gas will be for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years, it's extremely difficult to pick one number. In these calculations for my hypothetical 50,000 dwellings, I've simply assumed a typical price in Europe over the last five or six years. But again, I want to highlight that this is just my assumption and this is very much open to debate about exactly what it should be, especially when we look to the future. However, one thing about the future that is very clear right now is that natural gas is very unlikely to get cheaper in the very long term. Maybe there will be short term decreases due to the shortages in demand and so on, but over the very long term it's very likely to increase. And the reason for that is because first of all, natural gas itself is a finite resource. So at some point, whether it's 10 years from now or 30 years from now, that finite resource will become less and less and therefore the price will increase. If we don't rely on natural gas and instead return to uh, turn to other sources of gas such as biogas, gasified biomass or synthetic gas, which is often referred to as power to gas or the production of gas from electricity, all of these alternative options are also very expensive. There is no, let's say, cheap alternatives for the gas supply that are currently available. And that means that uh, even whether we rely on natural gas or we turn to an alternative form of gas, at some point in the future, it's very likely that the price of gas will be much more than what we've been used to in the past. And that's a very important context to set because even though I can't define an exact number, the context can be defined that it's very unlikely to be cheaper in the future than it is has been in the in the past. So that means using the number that I assumed here, which I outlined earlier, just the which was around the uh, typical price for the last five years in Europe. This gives you then the total price, uh, the total annual price of supplying natural gas to my hypothetical 50,000 dwellings. And as you can see, the supply price is around the same level as the boiler costs. So these are the two biggest components for natural gas, whereas the piping is the smallest of the three key components. Now we need to discuss, on the other hand, what is the supply price for district heating? So what is our heat supply price? And the main source of heat supply right now is actually excess heat from power stations. And the reason that is, is because if I take a power station like the one here on the left hand side, that power station will produce a lot of electricity and it will also produce a lot of heat. But right now there's a lot of power stations all around the world that actually don't use the heat. They simply discard it into a surrounding river, sea or lake. And that means that the entire profit from the power station is based on the electricity market. So these plants will often sell electricity for maybe 50 or 60 euros per megawatt hour to the electricity market. But as you can imagine, the, the fish market doesn't play very well, pay very well, so they're currently getting zero euros per megawatt hour for their heating. Just to put this in context, a typical power station like this about half of its energy would come out as electricity and about half of its energy would come out as heat. So right now the fish market is getting about half of all the energy from this power station. So you could say that right now district heating in theory has a heat supply price of zero euros per megawatt hour if we look at the competitor that's currently in that market at the moment, which is the fish. How, another really surprising fact is just how much of this there is. This, these three columns here demonstrate the total um, energy in Europe as it goes from primary energy to the end user. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of this graph, but just to break down the key points, this uh, green-yellow 
area here on the left hand side this this part here it highlights the amount of fuel that's actually put into the power stations while the next column represents the amount the total electricity produced by the power stations and the difference between the first and second column for this yellow part is the is an indicator of how much heat we're actually you losing during electricity production in Europe today so this is you could say an indicator as to how much heat is currently going to the fish market if we then compare that to the amount of heat that's actually required in buildings to, in Europe today, we can see that there's a lot more heat being wasted from electricity generation than there is required to heat all of the buildings in Europe right now. In other words, we have more heat lost during electricity production than we need to heat all of the buildings. That means we're not just selling heat for a very cheap price to the fish market, we're actually over supplying that market enormously. We're per supplying more heat to the fish than we actually need for all of the humans. In, in Europe right now. Another important part of all of this is to set the future context in the same way that I talked about natural gas. So right now I've only covered power stations and the amount of excess heat from those facilities, but we also have excess heat from industry and waste incineration uh, already available today, while in the future we can imagine more excess heat coming from places like biorefineries and hydrogen production facilities. And even if we don't have this excess heat, there's a lot of relatively low cost renewable alternatives that we can already use, such as solar thermal, geothermal, heat pumps and electric boilers. And all of these are already being used on district heating systems around the world today. So they're already available technologies and they're already proving competitive with their alternatives. So let's just say not only is there a lot of cheap and um, plentiful excess heat today, but there's a lot of relatively cheap alternatives to that excess heat for the future, which means that district heating, you could say, is a relatively safe bet in the long term, um, not just in the short term. So therefore, you could say in theory there is a price on the heat supply of zero euros per megawatt hour, um, and, but it is very difficult to, un, to, to predict what exactly will be the final price when we move this from a fish market to a heat market. Because of course the power stations won't sell their heat for zero euros per megawatt hour because they'll want to make some money if they see this new market appearing. However, if I assume zero euros per megawatt hour from the outset, you can see that district heating then is around half the price of natural gas supply. And this is why in a lot of our energy modeling work, district heating comes out as such a cheap option. Because if we simply take this heat that we currently throw away, put it into our district heating networks and supply the buildings, we're significantly reducing the costs of our heat supply in these urban areas. If uh, I just made a hypothetical scenario here where if we charge 30 euros per megawatt hour for this heating, then we'll actually break even with natural gas. And this is just to give an indicator that the power stations could charge, let's say, up to 30 euros per megawatt hour for this heat, and then they'd be breaking even with their closest competitor, which would be the natural gas grid. And the reason that this is very interesting and very important to remember is because is that this is just one scenario for, for the cost that I'm assuming here. In other words, the price I've assumed for gas grids, the price I've assumed for district heating pipes, the price I've assumed for the heat supply is all just one scenario. And when we start talking about the future, there's a lot of different scenarios you can construct to make this argument turn in different ways. So it's up to you then to, uh, uh, to interpret all of these uh, risks and these scenarios with yourself and see which you feel is the most reasonable for us. I personally see district heating as a much safer bet and a much cheaper alternative according to all of our results uh, so far than the natural gas grid. Another really important thing to note is that if, let's say, we install this district heating system in a lot of cities and then the power stations start charging 30 euros per megawatt hour because that's what they can charge while still providing heat at the same price as natural gas. So one really important dynamic that's likely to occur then is that rather than charge 55 euros per megawatt hour for the electricity market, the heat market is likely to offset some of these costs and the electricity market price is likely to decrease. Now, the reason this is so important is because I've just given a scenario where I'm claiming that the price for the heat market is closer to zero euros per megawatt hour than it is to 30 euros per megawatt hour. But if you look at the statistics, you will see that a lot of power stations around the world are charging even more than 30 euros per megawatt hour today. And the reason that is, is because once you have a market, then you will obviously start charging what you can 
for it and it might not necessarily reflect the actual price of producing that commodity because that commodity might be offsetting prices in another market like you would imagine happening in this scenario where once you get some income from your heat market that will then allow you to offset some costs in your electricity market which then makes you more more competitive in the electricity market which then makes you let's say produce more electricity in that market and therefore get more income overall so it's just to present that dynamic because perhaps you'll find when you look at the it's the statistics, you don't get heat market prices of zero euros per megawatt hour. And the reason for that, of course, is that there's a lot more dynamics occurring in these markets than just the true price of producing that product. Then just to come back to the work we're doing in Heat Roadmap Europe, you can down, go and visit our website heatroadmap.eu. Our online interactive heat atlases will demonstrate some of the areas where this is possible to start implementing. So for example, I've taken an extraction for Genoa in Italy here, where if you select Genoa, you can see the potential for developing district heating networks in that city. And you can also see by the triangle here beside the city, which I've circled in red, is a local power station that could supply heat to that new district heating heating system. By clicking on our interactive heat atlas, you can see that this power station could potentially supply up to a maximum of about a quarter of the heat demand in that local city. So in other words, if this power station started connecting to a district heating system and sending the heat to that network in the city, then it could replace about a quarter of the natural gas currently consumed for heating in that city, rather than simply throwing its heat away into the surrounding sea. And this is an example of the type of uh, results we're producing in the project to make it more visible about how to get started. Another really interesting study we did as part of the Heat Roadmap Europe series was the hotspots analysis. And this was an analysis of all of Europe to demonstrate where are the most attractive areas to start developing district heating today due to the amount of excess heat available and the very high demands in the local area. So if you're looking for those hotspots, then feel free to check out this study we completed in the past. You'll also find on our website a lot of our models and tools we use to complete our analysis. And the three key conclusions I just want to highlight here are, first of all, that supply can be the biggest cost on these heat network, um, on these on these heating networks. So supply being the biggest price, followed by the boilers and substations and then the pipes. And that's why debating and concluding on what the supply price should be is so important. Because obviously, if we assume that we pay the fish market price for supply for district heating, then supply is almost no cost. Whereas if we assume Assume, let's say that it's a market driven price, then it's very likely to be the biggest price. So this is just to reveal that if you're sitting here right now developing a district heating network, it's really important that you pin down what exactly your supply price is, rather than focusing so much on the pipes, which is what often people think is the most important part. The second key conclusion is that district heating in all of our results to date has proved to be cheaper than natural gas because we can currently take a product that we throw away, which is, let's say, the, the excess heat that goes to the fish market, and we can start using that to replace natural gas that we currently pay a lot of money for. Even in the future context, this is likely to continue because natural gas alternatives are expensive, whereas district heating has a number of other excess heat and renewable heat options that are likely to be cheaper in the future. Finally then, it's not just about price. A lot of our advanced modeling in the Heat Roadmap Europe studies show that by replacing a fossil fuel like natural gas with a product that we currently throw away, which is excess heat to the fish market, we're not just saving money, but we're also lowering energy consumption, we're lowering carbon emissions, and we're enabling ourselves to use more renewable energy. So it's a package of benefits that make this such a good idea in the long run. So feel free to check out our website, heatroadmap.eu, if you want more information. There's a lot of models, tools, maps, and data on the website that might help you with your work. Also, please follow our Twitter or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the video about comparing natural gas and district heating with one another.